plants, most of your transplant plant plants uh, weed free for three to five weeks. After that, you could pretty much let the weeds go nuts. Um, that's what that's saying right there. So more than five weeks for direct seed veggies like corn, small canopies, and wide spacing. Uh, weed prevention strategies don't, okay, here's more. Um, you clean your equipment before moving it to an infested field, okay? I have a backpack sprayer that is, I have two backpack sprayers that are used for this purpose. I have one that's got a bleach solution in it, and that's for pathogens, and then I have one that um, has vinegar in there, and that's for seeds. So any tools that I bring from one area to the other, I always hit them with both, and I hit my boots, and then I go into my field. So I'm, I'm a stickler about um, sanitation, and that is the best way to keep weeds out of your field, is to kill the seeds that is in the dirt and in the soil that is stuck to your tools and in your boots and stuff. Um, of course, buy uncontaminated crop seed from a reputable source. Thoroughly compost at at least 131 degrees Fahrenheit for three days any manures or other residues that contain seeds. Chicken manure. Ooh. You better compost that. Because most of the, most stuff in there is perfectly good seed that just can be planted or just can be pooped out and, and start germination right there in the uh, chicken poop. Um, almost no oh, almost no seeds survive in chicken manure. That's that's BS. That's not true. That's, that's a big problem for Big Island farmers, actually, is getting uh, uncomposted chicken manure. Um, filter surface water if possible. So if you have water tanks, um, chances are that if there's weed seeds in there, they float. So having a skimmer or something off the top, um, keeping your irrigation clean by watching the top of your reservoir. Uh, apply fertilizers and irrigation directly to the crop row if possible. So banding your fertilizers down your rows instead of just broadcasting. And then also um, using drip line irrigation is highly recommended in Hawaii. And it would uh, allow you to only irrigate the rows. And that's when, when the crop has plenty of moisture because of the drip tape and two feet over it's dry as a bone and no weeds can exist, that's perfect. You know, the crop has plenty of moisture, but there's not any moisture for the, the weeds to grow. So drip tape is perfect for that, um, which was designed and developed in Hawaii by CTAR. So um, really cool invention that is taking off in Africa like crazy. Uh, work with your neighbors. You have to communicate with your neighbors if you're a farmer for Fertilizer reasons, IPM reasons, especially for weeds. Um, if you look across your property and it's nothing but guinea grass on the other side and you're busting your hump trying to keep this place clean, maybe it might be in your best interest to say, go to your neighbor and say, hey, what if I pay for this to be cleared out? And then, because it's his land, he doesn't touch it, what does he care? And it, it would actually cost you less money to clear out his land than to worry about your weeds, okay? <laughs> or you set it up so that um, you know you get you get some cattle or something over in your neighbor's yard, you know, or get some goats over there, and then everybody's happy, right? Cultural strategies: crop selection and rotation. Rotate weed susceptible crops: carrots, onions, widely spaced crops with. Uh, suppressive crops such as sweet corn, pumpkin, and sweet potatoes. So you go from one to the other, one when you rotate your crops back to the other. Weed suppressive cover crops should be used in problem areas. Ground cover critical for weed suppression. Um, no exposed soil. Pay attention to cover crop pest problems and requirements. And managing cover crops profitably, it's the uh, I think it's a write-up I gave you guys, um, if not that first one is. So crotillaria, the sun hemp, right here. You got ryegrass, sudex, buckwheat. Buckwheat's a great one to bring in pollinators. 
cover crops, brassica mix. So you can actually mix them together, which uh, for cover crops is highly recommended. So you have, like I said, you can have the sun hemp, which has got an apical growth, and then you got lab lab, which is kind of creepy, and then it kind of grows on top of each other, and it makes this huge mass of biomass, and there's no weeds going in there for sure. Um, oats is a great one because you can harvest them and sell it. This is a trial done on North Shore of Hawaii. Um, sun hemp and oats mixed together versus just sun hemp and versus just oats. So like I said, when you combine them together, you get a much better um, return, much better cover. Variety is selection and spacing. Choose crop varieties that are well adapted for your area. Plant at the best time of year for vegetative growth. Everybody should do that because you would have already done that during your crop selection phase. Um, choose crop varieties that are vigorous canopy development and purchase high quality seed, probably the most important. A uh, lot of times when you buy seed, there's weed seeds in there, um, especially for cover crops actually, because they're, they're harvested or they're grown and harvested in Africa. So there's like really no regulation as, as how clean it is and they don't really clean it when it comes out. So you gotta be really, really careful. Um, use transplants where possible and make sure that if you're using transplants that they're clean. Um, space plants at, a, at the higher end of recommended density ranges. So um, put more plants out, causes more canopy cover, prevents weeds. Cover crap. Alleopathy. Alleopathy is controversial, it is affecting weeds, fresh, blah, blah, blah. Um, that lab lab I told you has great alleopathy, so it will prevent other weeds from coming in. Um, gotta keep moving. Cereal rye. Mechanical strategies, cultivation. Um, very important strategy, railed on by many growers. Plant very straight, uniformly spaced rows and allow for close cultivation of these plants. Basically, planting in rows so that you can get equipment through that can address your weed issue, whether it be tilling or um, just mowing. Keep cultivation shall, uh, shallow to minimize weed seed germination. So don't till too deep, only just the area that you need for your plant. Um, cultivate weeds early. So once they get over an inch, or uh, just, uh, let's see, early, less than an inch, ideally at 50% field capacity. And push dirt into rows of long stem plants to cover small weeds. That's kind of like tilling, or it's, it's top surface tilling. So you have all these wonderful tools like the hoe, the hose on wheels, you got the, uh, the claws, garden claws, tillers that have uh, kind of like these weed prongs, and then you got the hand push ones too. So that's for when you're doing it in rows. Flex tines, usually behind the back of a tractor. Flex tines are great, it's really just a sheet of tiny little wires that are bent downwards and kind of comb and go into the first centimeter of the soil. So usually uh, with all of those tines in there, no plant is going to survive that going over the top and you have exposed soil right after that. You have an actual plow <laughs> that works. Um, spiders, these are apparatus that um, basically spin over and chop up the first centimeter of soil and without touching your crop right in the middle. Basket weeders, um, these are basically like those, what are those called, hooli hoes? Tiny little ones all on a, on a, uh, on a wheel. And it kind of just spins around and just cuts up the first top centimeter of the soil. Brush weeders, they're just brushes, kind of scrapes off the top layer of the soil. And then my favorite is flaming, because this is the one I use because it's a less invasive and it doesn't cause any problems for uh, microorganisms and it actually helps with the decomposition and the carbon to nitrogen ratio in your field because once you burn your weeds off, it becomes straight carbon. Um, so use flaming high temperatures, 
usually you do flaming when weeds are small, less than three inches. Weeds should be uh, well watered, but with a dry leaf surface. So you would essentially water your weeds the day before you're gonna go out and flaming. Why? Because when the water goes into the plant, those cells become so full of water and they're packed tight and it's perfectly irrigated and then you come along and you flame it, what do you do? What happens to the cell? Boom! So you just essentially come along and you explode every single cell in, the, in that plant and it's dead. So there it is, um, flaming. Uh, and I actually like to do it at night as well because you can see real good because of the flame and then it increases the uh, efficiency. Most effective on broadleaf weeds, grasses are more resistant. Like I said, there's usually that storage um, structure that's in the, in, in, uh, below the surface of the soil, so it's kind of hard with grasses. Uh, can be done before one to two days or after crop emergence. Tolerance of crops to flaming varies with species, so um, you don't want to flame with like lettuce and stuff, um, but certainly with things like coffee or something like that. So are we talking about torture? I'll show you. We'll get there. Um, talks about the how much propane per acre does it usually take. One gallon of liquid propane equals four pounds. And there's some examples. Um, on the tractors, on the tractors, they can actually drive along the rows and they'll just burn all down here. And the corn leaves, it's quite all right if you burn the bottom ones. It's not a big deal. Um, and then you have the ones that are for orchards that go on the side. You can literally just burn right around the trees. And then here's the backpack kind like I have, but I don't have a, I don't have a hood over the top. It's not even on a wheel. It's just a torch. Mm -hmm. Chemical strategies. Uh, you can use organic herbicides. They do exist. Active ingredients are usually essential oils or acids, uh, clove oil, acetic acid. What's acetic acid? Vinegar. Citric acid. Yeah. Um, not a lot in there, but it certainly is in there. I would get um, an actual amendment that has the citric acid. Uh, these are contact herbicides, effectively only on small weeds and more effective on broadleaf grasses. So basically, once you spray them out, they will kill the weeds that are there, but if any come up tomorrow, then those won't be affected. So far, uh, the economics are poor in a few studies done. So um, do you know what it takes to get clove oil? It has to be distilled. It's quite a process. Um, just like any essential oil, you go to the farmer's market and they got those little essential oils this big, how much they charge for those 12 bucks or something. Why? Because it takes an incredible amount of time, incredible amount of materials, and some really nice equipment to do that distillation. So um, it's usually, sometimes it can be, uh, like for lavender, it could be five gallon bucket of lavender flour for one ounce of lavender oil. So. When you're talking about using your essential oils in your field, quite a, quite a bold move. Um, I would actually use my clove oil to create a, uh, like a bug spray and sell that <laughs> because that works pretty good as a bug spray. But here it is, clove oil. All right, no clove oil and clove oil. It kind of works. Um, it says it's contact, so it's probably two or three days after contact. <laughs> Stale seed bed technique. This technique is used to exhaust the uh, active seed bank in the first inches of soil. Okay, first the area will be tilled, then it is fertilized, and then irrigated to promote seed, uh, weed germination. So you're actually fertilizing your weeds before you put out a crop. So you till the area, put some fertilizer out there, all the weed seeds that just got exposed and given the right conditions, all of a sudden they're like, yay! And then they come up, and they're ready to charge out, and then what do you do? Um, you kill them. So you, fer you fertilize them, you give them, get them excited, ready to go, and then because they emerged, you go out and you can find them and kill them. Okay? And then you allow the, seeds, uh, the weed seeds to flush again, and then you kill those again. So you continue irrigating and waiting for those um, nutrients to hit the, hit the seeds and cause that trigger for them to germinate. And then seeds or transplants are placed in the field with minimal or no tillage. What can you say? 
product that you can put in to cure your seeds in your garden? Yeah, so that's um, it's a, a pre-emergent herbicide. Is that good? It's very toxic stuff. Okay. I guess so. um, and it, once it rains, it pretty much leaches away, and you got to do it again. And it's like, where does that stuff go? You know, um, pre-emergent herbicides quite commonly used in nurseries. So they usually will just put a what do they call a, one of them? Star. Lone Star. Lone Star. It's one of the most po popular ones. They just put a couple granulars down in the pot, and then no weeds will come up. But it's like, what is, how is that affecting the plant? And, yeah. So you recommend flaming? I recommend flaming, or the most effective way to get rid of weeds? Use your hand. I hand pull. Almost all my weeds I hand pull. You got guys like John Caverly up here that runs an organic farm. He's got 25 acres. What does he have? He has 10 woofers out there every day pulling weeds for four hours. And that's what he has to do. And then he feeds them and lets them go for the rest of the day. He doesn't need the woofers for anything else. All he uses them for is pulling weeds. So they're not learning anything. <laughs> but they get to stay in Hawaii for free. So. Um, it depends on how you negotiate your labor. Oh, okay. See, if I was an organic farmer, I would certainly have woofers because it's slave labor. So all I got to do is give them a bucket of gruel and they, they'll pull weeds for me. So it's... <laughs> woofers uh, personally are not my favorite people in the world because um, they, make it, they make it very difficult for a guy like me to hold a job in Hawaii. So if you go and you spend $35,000, $40,000 in tuition to get a degree in agriculture, and then you go out and try to get a job as a farm manager, they won't hire you. Why? Because they'll turn to you and go, I got 10 people that cost me less than what you would cost me. Yeah. And I can get 10, you know, they may not know what's going on. They may not know like what I know, but the farmer can go along and just go, okay, do this, do this, do this. And then he has 10 people do it for him. So whenever I pick up woofers and stuff, like a hitchhiking and stuff, I, la I lay into them. Oh man, do I lay them. I always ask them, where are you from? You know, where are you from? It's usually Germany or something. Uh, where are you from? Um, why are you here? And what do you know about agriculture? And what have you learned about agriculture since you've been here? And it's always, we just go to the beach, man. We go out and pull weeds and it's like, I, and then I, because I usually will pick them up like Honoka and then I'll drive them all the way into Hilo or all the way over to Puna. So I got them for like an hour and I'll just be like, by the way, um, you people take our jobs. You, 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 don't, you, don't, help, you don't help the uh, agriculture industry you know, excel in any way. You come, you learn nothing, and then you leave. At slave labor, you know, you guys aren't offered the types of things you should be offered, like health insurance and things like that for doing these types of things. They're not offered. And, and I just let them know that what you're doing is hurting agriculture. And then they, they're just like, oh. And they're like, well, we have to rethink. And I had uh, two, two women from Sweden that were in the back of my truck. And by the time they got on my truck, they were ready to leave Hawaii. They were like, we are causing problems for these people. I'm like, yes, you are. But anyway. That's right. OK, we went through that. Uh, mechanical techniques, of course, mulching. There is going to be uh, organic mulches, and there's going to be inorganic mulches. You got plastic, and then you got uh, plant material. In general, grasses persist the longest, legumes the shortest, living mulches if controlled properly, can increase soil moisture and bioactivity. So this is going to be cover crops, essentially. Um, don't want to get too technical into mulch. We know what mulch is, right? We know why it works. That's a lot of mulch. So you got black plastic. Oh, I want to talk about solarization. So uh, effective way to get rid of weeds. You will kind of mow down an area. Um, don't till, but just mow it so that the grasses and weeds are low. Lay some black plastic out. Uh, you can use clear or black plastic. No, because the reason is you're cr trying to create an environment that uh, is so hot and moisture rich that the plants will die. So you put black plastic out, sun comes out, it hits that black plastic and creates a temperature gradient down to almost two feet. And, um, that is high enough temperatures to kill off seeds. So once it gets up to like 130 degrees in that area, those ger don't germinate, they actually die off. 
So that's solarization. Um, and then you can use clear plastic as well, which is kind of sometimes used uh, on Oahu. And the, only because it's cheaper, it doesn't work as well because the light will actually, the, the radiation from the light will actually bounce back out. So you don't get as much heat than if you had black plastic. So clear plastic, much cheaper. That's why it's used. Um, whatever. Here we go. Got to keep moving. Uh, so you got the uh, mulching at the plastic mulches. There's machines that you can, um, that have rolls that you can just tar cart along and it pulls it real nice and tight and then puts down stakes every 10 feet for you. So you can actually lay out some pretty nice black plastic with machinery. Biological controls, of course, you want to use, you can use insects um, and you could also use pathogens. Ted has a great write-up on using biological control for weeds. Um, I recommend you check out that link. Uh, you could also use domesticated animals, so uh, chicken tractors. You can use goats and all those wonderful things. Chickens are great for weeds. Um, get a chicken tractor, you get a six by six little box that you can pick up and move, and you put the chickens in it, and then you move it every day. And they just sit there and scratch that stuff out. They pull out all the little nuts and all the little roots, and they eat the bugs. And then you don't have to buy feed. It's fantastic. And you just move it along as you go. And maybe you have six or seven of them all over your property, and you can kind of do a nice paddock system. OK? Um, domesticated animals, great way to address weeds. Plus, they poop a lot. What is that information on the box? This is uh, grazing cages. These are d d designs for these. Um, Grazing cages, which are chicken tractors or goat tractors or whatever you want to do. Um, Glenn designs them. You can email him if you want to get a design for a chicken tractor. He will give you one. Done with that slide? Okay. Insect pest management. Talking about bugs. Preparation. What can you do to your crap? Crap. Crop. <laughs> what can you do to your crop before you plant it to prevent any insects? This is really important. So when you're doing your your farm management design, this is something that you're going to incorporate in your farm management design before you ever build anything on your farm, is how can you prevent insects from getting on your property, or at least the, the wrong ones? Some of you already have a farm. You just need to address it that way. You need to almost start from step one and look at the farm plan and see how its design can be changed to improve your insect problem. Uh, anticipate potential insect problems. Insects love wet anaerobic soil. So soggy soil. If you have a lot of soggy soil around your property, chances are you have a lot of insects. The drier the soil, the less insects are generally in it. So having a nice, perfect moisture content for your soil is part of that limiting factor thing. Um, if you don't have the right moisture content, then everything else kind of falls by the wayside. Cultural techniques. Um, basically, planting plants out there that will attract other insects or, by cultural, you know what I mean, right? Cultural practices, something that you do to facilitate something else. Uh, scout for your pests before you plant. Go out and look at all the insects. Start collecting insects. Put them in a bag, put them in a little thing, a little jar. Start collecting them so that you can start identifying what your problem insects are. And then all of a sudden you realize that this one insect keeps showing up everywhere. Well, you do a little bit of research and you find out that that insect generally stays on one type of plant. And you look into your neighbor's yard and it's just nothing but that plant. And then you go, OK, here's my problem. This is what I need to address is because I've done my research and I know exactly what the um, insect is. Identify your problem. Insect, man mammal, pathogen, and uh, the level of damage. Um, you basically set your threshold. Uh, 
Identification. Observe characteristics of the insects. Um, I really like to trap them so you can get a really, really good look at them. If you don't like to touch or trap bugs, get out into the field, get your head up under that bush and go look for them, okay? There's a lot of techniques for, um, for gathering insects in your field that I strongly recommend, I'm not gonna talk about today, that I strongly recommend you getting involved in, like um, doing things like taking a white sheet and putting it out underneath your problem tree. Say you have a citrus tree and there's insects all over it, you're not sure what the insects are, you put a sheet down and you grab a branch and you shake that thing, and then all of a sudden, boom, 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 they all fall down, and then you can take your little jars and gather up what's on your tree. And so, or you can put netting over, a, you can put netting over a tree overnight. Um, there's also traps uh, that you can use that are like water dishes that are on the surf, you bury in the, on, on the soil surface so that as a bug crawls along on the soil surface, he, whoop, he falls right in. And you have that at the base of your tree. So if you see, if you can't identify an insect on your tree, but maybe in the middle of the night, you're thinking that something crawls along, maybe that's a great way to trap it. Uh, using light traps at night. So you actually have a light that's over a bucket of water and you shine the light right into the water and the flies or the bugs will come along and <coughs> dive bomb right into the water and die. Well, you get to have them and you can identify them, okay? So proper identification, proper techniques of actually gathering your insects. What stage of development is the insect, the problem insect in at that time? So a lot of times it's the uh, caterpillar larvae phase that causes the most problems for farmers. So knowing that, allows you to address the IPM um, treatment. And the go-to move is the dichotomous key. Anybody know what a dichotomous key is? <laughs> Let's put this here. I'm trying to grab this thing. There you go. We're going to use this today during your activity. This is how you are going to identify. Why is it so stretched out? How you're going to identify your insect. It's really interesting. I love dichotomous keys because they allow you to really properly identify your insect based upon characteristics of the insect. So once you get your insect into a jar and you're able to look at it or under a microscope like we're gonna look at today, you start answering the questions within the key. So does your creature have eight legs or six legs? Well, if it has eight legs, chances are it's a spider, right? Or and it's a uh, arachnid. So you're gonna not use the insect dichotomous key. You're going to click on here and use the arachnoid. Now, if it has six legs, go on to question number two. Insect has wings. Click here if it does, click here if it doesn't. So let's say it doesn't have wings. And then you start going down from number one. Does it, does it have eyes? Some of them have evolved to not have eyes. Well, if it does have eyes, we're gonna go down to number four. Has six segments on the abdomen? has more than six segments. Well, I'm gonna say it has six, so there you go. I just discovered that this is the area for which my insect is, and it gives me the orders, and, and there it is. So I can now properly identify um, my insects based upon the dichotomous key. So well, we, when we do the activity, I'll have, I'll have this set up, my computer set up, and you guys can properly identify your insect based upon the dichotomous key. Phone's off. <laughs> I didn't turn mine off. I hope mine doesn't ring. <laughs> These guys are awesome. You know what that is? This is true? <laughs> that is a spittle bug. Those are the ones that look like uh, somebody hocked a loogie on the side of a plant. And it's like a foamy, mucusy ooze called spittle bugs. And what they do is they pupate inside this mucus membrane that is, looks